you have your Bibles, turn with me tonight to Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64. Tonight I'm going to speak on the subject of ingredients for revival. Ingredients for revival. I know we are calling it a Bible conference, uh, you know, because there's so much Bible study, the day times and things like that. Uh, but my personal prayer for next week is we uh, start out in a Bible conference and we break out in revival. That's what I would love for God to do in our church. Uh, so let me give you the outline if you have an outline with you there. Anybody need an outline? Ted's got them there or a prayer list. He could help you either way. All right, number one, there's three ingredients I want to share with you. Number one, God's holy presence. God's holy presence. We will not have revival without the presence of God, without a manifestation of His Spirit. Uh, number two, confession of sin. Confession of sin. Uh, again, it is a must. It is must. And the, we could we could have listed five, uh, but for the allotted time, uh, three is all I'm covering. And number three, and this is this is big here. Be willing to change. I think one of the things in our Christian life that sometimes gets us uh, is I don't want to use the word routine, but just you know to where you know you you you're doing what you need to do but nothing really changes it. I mean, you may be content, but you may not be content. And as a Christian, I never need to be satisfied where I'm at with the Lord. There's always something that I can improve on. There's always something uh, that could uh, help my walk with Him. Uh, so that's, that's another thing that we are going to look at. Uh, ingredients for revival. I want to first say is what is true revival and I just wrote this down uh, it is a divine movement of the Holy Spirit that produces total surrender in all areas of one's life it is a divine movement of the Holy Spirit that produces total surrender in all areas of one's life and again folks uh, for us to have church revival we have to have individual revival. It truly begins with us looking at our own lives and seeing where we are spiritually. I want to share with you three facts about true revival also. Number one, you can't work it up. Okay, you can't work it up. Number two, you can't fake it. You cannot fake true revival. And number three, you cannot control it. Okay, when you think about uh, the Acts chapter 2 church and the explosion that happened, uh, you know, on the day of Pentecost and uh, 3,000 souls got saved later after that. And, you know, all through uh, the early book of Acts, you see these manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And, and that's what I uh, pray. And, and the other thing, folks, I think we are right on target. Uh, you know, he always sends a list of about 12 different subjects that he has written material on and has studied. And uh, when, I, when I said, you know, we're not going to wait till the fall, we want something in the spring because uh, everybody, Dr. Mike Taylor, really enjoyed him. And uh, they just said, man, you, you have to have that guy back. Uh, the one that stood, stood, stood out more than anything is on prayer. And uh, I really, I know Tony and our prayer ministry you know, it's getting off the ground. And uh, just this past Saturday, uh, after our meeting, that was the largest group that we have had in praying. And by the way, uh, I, I would love for, you know, us to have a, a good group. And, and the total emphasis this Saturday at 5 o'clock is going to be on true revival and on revival. Uh, so if you want to join us, you do not have to pray. Just you being here, just you supporting us uh, in in your presence, uh, make a real difference in uh, your life and in the life of our church. You know, Isaiah, I believe, was one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, one, another one that's one of my favorites is Elijah. Elijah. And, uh, you know, Isaiah prophesied that God would use the Assyrians 
uh, to discipline the children of Israel because they trusted in man and fell into foreign worship, uh, gods, foreign gods. Uh, through Isaiah's leadership, he encouraged Israel to repent of their sin and to ask God for true revival for the children of Israel. And there was four sins uh, that I noticed looking at the background material and uh, some of the things that I had studied uh, on Tuesday. And uh, this is one of the reasons I came tonight. Uh, you know, I got Lori bedded down. I got her fed. She took a pill. Okay, so she's going to be out for about two hours. Uh, but one of the reasons I came was because, and folks, I never do this. I'm telling you, never. But for some reason, I studied Tuesday morning for Wednesday night. I always study for that night, Wednesday night on Wednesday morning, not knowing what was going to happen the next 24 hours. And some some online may not know what happened. Lori fell. Uh, she fractured her. Is that humerus bone? What bone is that, Cindy? You remember humerus bone? And uh, anyway, it's swollen. Uh, we have to see an ortho tomorrow. They don't think she's going to have to have surgery. Uh, but the second reason I came tonight was because we're having revival. And I think God told me, because, you know, you know, I asked her half a dozen times, are you sure it'll be okay? Are you sure it'll be okay? She said, no, I'll be fine. All right? So uh, I just knew the subject of what was going on. And uh, I just felt like this was the message that God uh, wanted me to preach tonight. And matter of fact, the four reasons. Number one was paganism. Okay, paganism. Uh, the world's influence on them. Okay, paganism. They let uh, idol worship come in. And uh, they did, you know, they went away from absolute truth also. Second thing uh, they were guilty of was humanism. All right, we're talking about the children of Israel, and that's uh, being self-sufficient, okay, not needing God, just going about their life, not really uh, considering God like they should. The third thing was materialism, uh, things that they thought would make them happy. Uh, and, you know, when I look down through here, folks, is this not the world in which we live in now? It's no different today than it was back in the day of Isaiah. And the third thing was religion. And folks, there is a difference between religion and righteousness, okay? Religion is going through the motions, okay? Righteousness is wanting that desire to be right with God. And, uh, you know, folks, I, I don't ever want to get there uh, where, I, where I'm just simply religious and not righteous. So let's look at Isaiah 64, verse 1. Oh, that you would rend the heavens. Matter of fact, I subtitled this. Most of the time I don't subtitle things, but I subtitled this after I studied this scripture, a revival prayer. If you are looking for a revival prayer in the Bible, I believe it's found in Isaiah chapter 64. Oh, that you would rend the heavens. And of course, we know rend means tear, okay? Uh, that means open up the heavens. Uh, one of the favorite songs that I hear, uh, that I hear our choir and our that we sing is "Open Up the Heavens." What's the name of that? Oh, there you go. <laughs> That's the name of it. Open up the heavens, and folks, it's based on scripture. Okay, and I love when our choir and when we sing that. Okay, what you're saying, Holy Spirit's presence, just come down. Okay, come down. That you would come down, that the mountains might shake at your presence. And again, you know. God used earthquakes to do a lot of things, but really what I believe he is talking about is something way beyond routine, something that's not normal, okay? Uh, you know, I, I realized Paul and Silas and there was an earthquake many times that happened, and I'm not saying God can't use that, but it's just, I believe uh, in our application, it, it is simply saying something unusual happens, a, 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 a Holy Spirit moment, one of those wow moments is what uh, he is speaking of in verse 1. Now verse 2, as fire burns brushwood and, and as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries that the nations may tremble at your presence. We know what fire does. 
You know, there's fires going on in New Mexico. There's fires going on in uh, Colorado. Uh, fires going on in Arizona because of droughts. And we see the destruction. I mean, you could have a home one day and it'd be burned down to the ground. And uh, again, that's the negative side of fire. But here, again, I believe it's talking about the Holy Spirit here. That the Holy Spirit would just burn in our hearts. Uh, if you remember Jesus uh, during post resurrection times, was walking with those two disciples. I mean, they, they simply said when Jesus was speaking the Word of God that it just burned in our hearts. And folks, we need to keep praying for Dr. Michael Taylor that he'll come in here fired up. Uh, that, uh, and again, folks, you have to understand this. Man cannot bring revival. You can't do it. God brings revival. He just uses men of God to do that. And then the second reason here is to make your name known. And wouldn't it be neat to, to maybe have attached to our name, I don't know what happened at Rye Hill Baptist Church, but I heard the heavens fell down. Okay? Uh, and again, it's not to brag on our church. Folks, it's not to say, look what we have done, because we can't bring revival. It's simply, uh, you know, opening ourselves up to God, opening ourselves up to His Holy Spirit. It's just, you know, begging God for His presence, asking for a manifestation of the Spirit, so that even the pagan world around us, around us, will take notice and listen. And then verse 3, and when you did awesome things for which we did not look for, you came down. The mountains shook at your presence. And we can, one of the things I remember uh, right before uh, Moses took uh, the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, the Bible says the earth shook, okay, at that time. And, and that's, what, that's what we need, folks. Uh, you know, uh, just a shaking uh, of the Lord. And him, him just getting a hold of our hearts and, and just really speaking to us uh, so that we know His presence is around us. And then verse 4, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard or perceived by ear, nor has the eye seen any God beside you. When you think of all the uh, happened, uh, you know, the exodus, you think of the miracles that had happened along the way, of course, everyone talks about the parting of the Red Sea, okay? I mean, even the enemies of God and the enemies of Israel feared and shook uh, thinking about what God had done. And it said, uh, who acts for the one who waits for him. And folks, I promise you, God wants revival in our church. There is no doubt in my mind and there's three kinds of His presence I want to share with you. If you'll look at that, that first uh, point that we have there, A, uh, you can write out beside His promised presence. His promised presence. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18 verse 20. And I love this verse. Where two or three are gathered in my, together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Folks, it's not about numbers, all right? It's not. We are not here, uh, you know, and I'm still, people are, I'm, I'm talking to our members and people uh, in town, even this past week as I went around, they, I, I heard, you know, at the pastor's conference, y'all had over 600 in church, which is wonderful, Easter Sunday, 656. But that's not why we do it. That is 656 uh, souls under the sound of the gospel. That is 600 uh, people uh, worshiping together. And so, you know, it's so important where two or three are gathered. That is his promised presence. The second thing is his manifested pre presence. His manifested pre presence. Look at Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. 
Each one had six wings with uh, two covered his face, two covered his feet, and, and two flew. And one cried to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The earth is full of his glory. Folks, I am telling you, God wants his glory to come down. God wants us to sense a manifestation of his spirit. And, and as we have a glimpse of heaven, folks, I am telling you, uh, the, the song, I can't remember, I, it's probably the same name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Uh, all right, I keep I keep thinking of these uh, songs that come into my head that talk about God's presence, and they're so important. His promised presence, His manifested presence, and His powerful presence. In Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 43, His powerful presence. Look at verse 1. Afterward, He brought to me the, to the gate, and the gate that faces towards the east. And behold, the glory of God, of the God of Israel, came from the east. And by the way, this is Ezekiel's vision of the glory of God coming back to the temple. It had left, okay? They, they had uh, went away from God, the presence of God. And folks, you know in a service whether the presence of God is there or not. You don't, have to, you don't have to guess about it, all right? And that's one of the things, especially guests have said. I remember Dave, David Lovegrove, the first time I went to visit them when they lived right over by us, you know, they lived about a, two blocks from our house. He said, they come through this back door, and he said, when we opened the door back there and started toward the sanctuary, we felt the presence of God. And folks, that's, what we're talking about. It's not about us. It's about the presence of God. And that is so important. That's that Shekinah glory of God uh, there. And the Bible says uh, in verse 3, and it was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the vision which I saw when I came to destroy the city. And uh, of course, that was the judgment of God. Uh, the visions were like the visions which I saw by the river Chabar. And I fell on my face. All right, I, I love that song, you know, you know, uh, the holy, uh, all Phil sings it. I, I bowed on my knees and cry holy. And Phil, I, I am not kidding you. I've heard that song a hundred times, and that was the best I've ever heard. And I know Phil won't take credit for that, but God used Phil in a mighty way. Matter of fact, if I die before you, I want you to sing that at my at my funeral. I seriously do. I mean, it was just it was again like uh, the Easter song, you, you know, "Behold the Lamb." It's just one of those wow moments, just wow. And that's that's the vision that you're having here. And the glory of the Lord came into the temple by the way of the gate, which faces to the east. Now here it is: the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Folks, and again, we don't call it a temple, we call it a sanctuary. But I long for that revival, for that service, that worship service, to where the glory of the Lord just fills this place. So we see God's holy presence. The second thing we see is confession of sin. Confession of sin. Look back in Isaiah. Isaiah 64. Verse 5. You meet him who rejoices and does righteousness, who remembers you in his ways. You are indeed angry, for we have sinned. In these ways we continue, and we need to be saved. Folks, part of that is... Part of that is lost people, okay? Lost people. He's speaking to the lost. But folks, I believe with all my heart, revival starts with the saved. It's with the Christian. It is Christians getting right with God so the presence of God can manifest itself there. And, and here it is so important that, yes, we need to reach the lost. We need to invite the lost. But I'm telling you, it starts with 
the Christian. Look at verse 6. But we are all like an unclean thing, in all our righteousness are like filthy rags. Folks, I'm just telling you, uh, you know, I, I know we have been forgiven for our sins, but when you when you read this verse, the best you have, your absolutely best, compared to Jesus in His righteousness, and His holiness, okay, is like filthy rags. Folks, we know what filthy rags are, okay? You work on cars and get filthy rags. You, there's all kinds of ways. You work hard. Ladies in the house scrub things in the rag. You work, you know, polishing your car, cleaning your car. It's like filthy rags. So what he's saying is there, and again, folks, we're not going to reach sinless perfection. That's not what he's talking about. It's admitting it. Admitting that we are not where we need to be with God. That's what confession is. You realize sometimes it's just an attitude? Okay? It may not be a blatant sin. You may not be a gossip or a, a backbiter or, or, or you just go through whatever there. But just your attitude. You may not have the right attitude. And I think a thing that we do not understand even when we're getting ready on Sunday mornings, folks, that's when the, really, to me, it starts on Saturday night. And when I say Saturday night, number one, am I going? Number two, am I laying my clothes out? Number three, when I get up, am I getting up with the right attitude? Am I come? And folks, could you imagine what would happen if 450 people came with an expectant attitude? You are expecting God to do something. And it's not, well, I hope you're doing, man, I know that guy. Boy, that dude, God needs to get a hold of his heart. That's not what we're talking about here. Okay, the easiest thing to do is to blame someone else, folks. It starts with us. Everything that I read, everything that I've seen, it starts in individual Christians. So our best is like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf. What's fade? We're, we're just not on fire anymore. We still love God. We still come to church. But, but that, that you know, feeling of reaching out and touching Him, that feeling of just coming to the altar and praying, just, just the attitude of God, whatever, whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do it. And our iniquities are like the wind and have taken us away. And folks, it's easy to fall into that pattern, that routine, that punch the clock mentality. It really is. And there is no one who calls on your name, who stirs himself up to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. And I know... All that sounds kind of harsh, but folks, I am telling you, we have to be able, we have to open ourselves up uh, to that uh, examination table. We have to put ourselves on that examination table. We have to look into that spiritual mirror and let God see us as we are. And the bottom line is this, folks. Sin blocks the fellowship with God. It will not... We're still sons of God. We are still daughters. You, you ladies are daughters of God. We're still God's children. But folks, it's like when children mess up, okay? And I truly believe uh, this is where we have really, uh, you know, there's, there's discipline, uh, you know, uh, that is very, very important. God disciplines His children. And we have taken the paddle. Man, I remember when we were in school, my my, when I was in late grade school, uh, I got to know Mr. Stever on a first name basis. I'd go into the principal's office. He said, "Mike, what'd you do today?" Okay, and and man, he give you three licks, and it was like, boom, boom. I mean, they they just I'm telling you, it's not happening today. Okay, and what the problem is is now the kids know. Nothing's going to be done about it, so they don't have to mind you in the first place. And folks, there's two things about God's discipline. Number one, if He disciplines you, 
you're his you're one of his okay don't take that as a negative thing that means he knows you you're one of his and he's whooping his children and the second thing is it's just like my mom used to say because my dad worked a lot okay and my mom would say this is going to hurt me and i honestly believe she was not lying it's going to hurt me more than it hurts you Number one is she had a very sensitive heart. Number two is I ran really well when I got older. She'd grab me and we'd just go around the circle. She'd miss me about half the time she was trying to give me licks, okay? And the deal is, folks, knowing that God and our relationship with God is not what it needs to be, you are the only one that can change that. I can't bring revival. Someone can't bring revival for you. It's an individual thing in your heart. And do you realize you can have revival when nobody else is having revival? You can have that. But I'm telling you, you first have to realize, man, I'm, I'm not where I am, or need to be, excuse me, spiritually. Psalm 66, 18. Psalm 66, 18. The Bible says, short verse, but it's very true. If I regard iniquity in my heart, if I, just, if I just don't acknowledge, if I just say, hey, I know, it, you know it's maybe the only sin I'm doing. Well, that's one too many. Okay, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Folks, God hears your prayers. He's just not going to answer your prayers. Okay, and you say, well, He always answers. He does, but I am telling you, a person in tune with God, God listens uh, His ear. I, I just can't tell you how many prayers we have had answered how many prayers uh just you know that that god has intervened for us so we we need to confess we truly do our sins and then psalm 139 psalm 139 verse 23 and 24 search me O god and know my heart and again you have to open yourself up to god you have to honestly say, God, is there anything in my life? On every Saturday night, and, and again, it usually starts with prayer right down here at 5 o'clock, and I just take that on to the house. But I always, before I do those last two hours of study and in preparation, I always do business with God. I say, God, is there anything in my life that I need to change? And I'm telling you many times, he will remind me of things. And it may not be the big things, all right? I'm not killing anybody. I'm not committing adultery. But folks, sin is sin. There's not degrees of sin. Sin is sin, and sin blocks your relationship with God. Search me, O God, and know my heart, and try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me. Notice the word any there, okay? I mean, folks, sometimes you got to dig under rocks. Okay, sometimes you've got to have just that honest one-on-one -on -one with God and lead me in the way of everlasting. And it's so, so important, folks, that we do business with God if we are going to see revival. So we see God's holy presence. We see the confession of sin. And the last thing is we have to be willing to change. We have to be willing to change. Back in Isaiah... Isaiah, verse 8 and 9, But now, O Lord, you are our Father. You are the clay, and you are our potter. We, are all, we all are the work of your hand. Folks, it's, it's what I call fine-tuning. It's what I call perfecting your spiritual walk with God. All right? It's just like a, a house makeover. Okay, every once in a while, I mean, you know, Lori watches all these Fix the House of Shows, okay? And I'm amazed at people that can take a dump. I'm talking holes in the roofs, and by the time they get through, it's like, are you kidding me? You know? And folks, that's, ha that's how we have to do with our own life, okay? We, we need that restoration in our life. We need that fresh touch from God we need that potter's hand on our life okay and that's what he does he molds us and he makes us into who we need to be 
Do not be furious, O Lord, nor remember the iniquity forever. Indeed, please look, we are all your people. So we have to understand that God loves His children, but God hates sin. Folks, He hates sin. He really does. We must, be allow, we must allow God to mold us. First to break us. First to break us and to mold us and to make us into who she, we should be. And you know the most important ingredient in churches and church revivals? Do you know the most important thing is brokenness? Brokenness. Seeing ourselves as we truly are. Being totally honest with God, begging God to examine our lives and see if there be any sin in us. Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Psalm 51, verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Blot it out, folks. We have to realize uh, that that is so important. And then verse 2, uh, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. And folks, we know what Psalms 51 was. All right, That's when David sinned against uh, Bathsheba and committed murder, Uriah. And he is just crying out to God. Verse 3, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Folks, there's, there's a thing that I've always said, admit it and quit it. Okay, you first have to admit it. You first have to say, hey, God, this is wrong. What, am I, what I am doing is wrong. And then verse 3, for I acknowledge my transgression, my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Let's skip down to verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Folks, we need to do that in our lives. We need to ask God. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Folks, it's not that you can lose your salvation. Okay, that is not what that's saying. It's, it makes you feel like you're not close to God. It makes you feel like you're, you know, that when you make peace with that sin, the spirits, uh, the manifestation of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit is not in your life. And then verse 12, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Uphold me by your generous Spirit. Two more scriptures and we're through. First John, First John 1 John 8. Look at 1 John 1, 8. The Bible says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. If anybody is sitting here saying, well, man, I, I haven't sinned. I don't have any sin. I don't even think I've sinned this week. We are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And I quote 1 John 1, 9 all the time, folks. If we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And folks, that's what's going to have to take place if we are to see revival beginning this Sunday. And, and folks, my prayer is that it starts Sunday morning. Matter of fact, I'd like it to start uh, Saturday night in, in our prayer time. I'd love for revival uh, to start then. Then one last verse, uh, Proverbs 28, 13. Proverbs 28, 13. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Folks, there is no doubt in my mind God wants revival in our church. Man cannot bring revival. Putting a date on a calendar will not bring revival. God only can bring revival, and He will do it through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Father, thank You for Your Word. God, just thank You for how you just speak to us through your word. And God, I just pray that as we prepare for our Bible conference uh, this Sunday, God, I pray that we would prepare our hearts. I pray that before Sunday morning, we will do business with you. God, I pray that we will do what the scripture says, examine ourselves. 
And God, I know we're in the faith. That's not the issue. God, we want to see revival. We want to see uh, the Spirit fall. We want to see a manifestation of your presence. So God, be with Dr. Michael Taylor. And God, we just thank you for him coming. God, thank you for uh, just uh, people uh, inviting other people. And God, again, we'd love to have a great crowd. But God, more than that, God, I pray that we could say when all is said and done, we had true revival at Rye Hill Baptist Church. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.